airfield in northern France. During the Second World War, this airfield was used by the German Luftwaffe. You can actually see the old tarmac. In hundreds of aerodromes like this one, the German Luftwaffe would take off to attack the Allied bomber formations. And for the first years of the war, they had a field day. In 1941, the Allies developed a versatile plywood aircraft known as the Mosquito. And this Mosquito could fly undetected into German-occupied Europe and attack these fighter bases. From 1941 to 1945, the Mosquito would serve as the Allies' most successful fighter bomber, carrying out some of the riskiest missions of the Second World War. We've come back to tell the story of the Mosquito and the men who flew them. Those men the Germans called the Bandits of the Air. September 1939, the Nazi war machine invades Poland, igniting the Second World War. The following May sees its attention turn west with the invasion of Belgium and France. The German Blitzkrieg quickly overwhelms the Allied forces, and by the beginning of June, the survivors are forced to retreat to England. Hitler's domination of Europe is complete. For the Allies, the situation is desperate. With no continental foothold for staging a counterattack and no foreseeable hope of invasion, their only means of striking back is from the air. But the RAF of 1940 is no match for the mighty Luftwaffe. And through the remainder of the year, the Germans exact a terrible toll on Allied bombers and crewmen. Although the Blenheim, when it was first introduced, was considered to be a, an advanced aeroplane, which it probably was in about 1936. But by the time the war came, it was getting a bit too slow and a bit too heavy and less manoeuvrable than it should have been. They got shot down uh, rather easily. I mean, the low-level operations in, in Blenheims were dangerous, there's no doubt about that. So, losses were quite high. It is clear to the RAF that the Allies need a new kind of aircraft, one capable of penetrating deep into enemy territory, with the speed and maneuverability to avoid German fighters, but with the capacity to deliver the destructive payload of a conventional bomber. And in 1941, they find their savior in the form of an unorthodox wooden aircraft, the de Havilland Mosquito. Based on the design of de Havilland's civilian aircraft, the Mozzie, as she becomes known, is a radically stripped down version of a conventional RAF bomber. Made almost entirely of wood and manned by only two crewmen, the Mosquito sacrifices defensive capability in exchange for increased speed and maneuverability. Constructed of a modest 40-foot wooden frame and with a wingspan of only 54 feet, the Mozzie is remarkably light at just over 14,000 pounds. Powered by two 1,400-horsepower Merlin engines, the streamlined aircraft can fly at speeds in excess of 400 miles per hour to a range of 1,700 miles. Armed with four 303 machine guns and four 20 millimeter cannons, the Mosquito packs a powerful punch. Add in a potential payload of four 500 pound bombs, and the aircraft becomes the Allies' ultimate fighter bomber. The Mosquito greatly impresses the RAF and is immediately put into service. In September 1941, the aircraft flies the first of many dangerous intruder missions striking deep inside Nazi-occupied Europe, taking the war back to the Germans at last. So we're 
we're just crossing the English Channel right now. We're at about 1,000 feet and about 150 miles an hour. So we're actually 950 feet at least higher than what the mosquitoes would cross at. Being a little cockpit that's like this, which is very much like a mosquito's, it really uh, gives you a, a very cool feeling. You can just imagine what this would have been like for these guys, and the decision of the flying. And to be able to go at about 200, 250 miles an hour, 30 feet over the channel, and then you gotta find out where you're going. I remember one pilot describing hitting the French coast as going over the top. Now you're in enemy territory. And that's where the real rooting would take place because the navigator had to determine where the anti-aircraft guns were. But ultimately, the Germans in 43 weren't ready to deal with low-level intruder operations. We crossed the narrow lake until we hit a railway line. We turned north, and in less than a minute, we were at the airfield. The first thing I saw was a church parade. After all, it was Sunday morning. At least 100 guys were drawn up in perfect lines in the middle of the field. The moment they heard our cannon, they broke and ran, stumbling and falling over each other. There were about a dozen ME-109s parked at the far side of the field. We closed to 50 yards with a two-second burst. One ME-109 exploded immediately. We hit two others. I can see the shells hitting home, and yellow flames coming out of the wing grooves, followed by a huge puff of black smoke. Although the pilots were obviously very good at the Mosquito, the navigator had to be just as good, and they had to work together as a team. And to me, one of the hardest things to understand about these operations is how the hell they found their targets. If you're not using radar, you have to pick up these landmarks, whether during the day or at night. And to be able to follow these canals, look for a hill, look for a tower, I honestly don't know how you could do that, especially when you're going 200 plus miles an hour at 50 feet. But the Mosquitoes used their versatility and their speed to get through the German defenses, which made every pilot love them. It was a different airplane altogether. Although it was made of good Canadian wood, um, it was very durable aircraft. There was nothing like it, even at low level. At full power, it could do almost 400 miles an hour, which was faster than anything else. Well, it was very exciting. Because here we had this, for those days, very high-speed airplane, very maneuverable. It's a mighty firepower. When you let go, the aircraft almost went backwards. <laughs> If you hit an aircraft with that kind of firepower, you could literally blow it apart. I love the airplane. I thought it was a beautiful airplane. I felt very safe in it. And it got us, it got us back. One of the beauties of the Mosquito was its versatility. It was used in photo reconnaissance operations, which are terribly important for intelligence. They were used as pathfinders, flare droppers for the heavy bomber missions. They were used as the fighter bombers. And these aircraft took missions deep into Germany. And they were striking at the heart of the Third Reich. We were told the evening before there would be an operation in the morning and what time we'd be called and so on. But Reggie said that he'd been briefed already, and I've, I've never forgotten it. This one is different. The RAF is putting the Mosquito to its greatest test yet. The mission, a long-range bombing raid into the heart of Germany. The target, a radio station in Berlin, where the head of the Luftwaffe, Field Marshal Hermann Goering, is to deliver an address to the German people. We walked into the ops room, and there's this piece of string that starts from Mauer and off. It went to Berlin, and everybody asked the same question. Do we have enough fuel to do that? We flew in, got up 25,000 feet, and we were above solid cloud all the way then. We 
just got to the stage where I was saying, I can't see any breaks in the cloud. We're going to have to bomb on time. When a very small break in the cloud appeared, and I said, hang on, there is a break. And I could see the lakes of Berlin. And of course, we knew where the radio station was, which was the aiming point. Then we dropped the bombs. Until the bombs hit the ground, there was no gunfire at all. I don't think they knew we were there. Later, after we bombed, we, we were able to hear a recording of the radio station. Under the mächtigen Sternwand, in der der gewaltige Hoheitsadler herüberschimmert, Göring was announced by the announcer, but never appeared. And there was a short silence. And then you could hear a, a, an explosion. Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring. Then you could hear some shouting in the distance. And then they played martial music. You know, they do go. Uh, an indication of some of the things that were possible. Between 1941 and 42, the speedy Mosquito proves itself an exceptionally effective weapon. In just 18 months, the aircraft flies over 1,000 sorties with remarkably few losses. In 1943, the RAF confirms its confidence in the Mosquito, ordering thousands of more aircraft, with mass production beginning in the UK, Canada, and Australia. But by mid-1943, the air war over Europe is escalating, and Mosquito crews will find themselves in even greater peril as they are assigned the most dangerous missions of the Second World War. Discover the past with exclusive military history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all on History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to watch everything, from the gripping story of the Band of Brothers to Operation Barbarossa and D-Day. Immerse yourself in the dramatic stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. We're on our way to Hunsdon Airfield, just north of London. It's probably the most famous mosquito airfield. And by 1943, as more mosquitoes were being produced and more squadrons equipped with the mosquito, three squadrons were operating out of Hunsdon, and they were the most successful intruder operators in the early parts of the war. Going out to Hunsdon to see what is left of this legendary airfield. I'm with Dennis Sharp, who's an expert on the Hunsdon airfield, and of course, this is where the mosquitoes operated in 1943, 1944. Do people around here know the history of this place? Not a lot of them do. As you see, it doesn't bear any relation today as, as to what it was then. This whole place was a sea of There are 442 buildings on Hunsdon Airfield. Now, today, uh, we're looking at about half a dozen at the most. This is one of the defence posts. That's right. This is uh, a Type 21 pillbox. It was uh, one of a ring of many around the actual perimeter of the airfield. You notice that these actual gun ports all point in towards the actual flying field of the airfield. Because with an airfield, the threat of invasion would have been carried out by either glider or paratroops, and they would have landed actually on the airfield to capture key facilities. We're out on the airfield now. So in 43, what were they using them for? Well, the airfield, more or less, uh, the whole, whole, whole of its life was dedicated to night fighters and intruders. The original uh, runway ended here. This was the threshold to the main runway. So this was the nice, smooth concrete? That's right. This had a, a dome, high-tensity light in it, 
these large marker lights in the ground denoted uh, the actual course. If you see there's like an arrow, which actually is built into the heading of the, uh, of the runway. That is, you took a compass bearing off of air and that will give you the exact uh, runway heading. When the airfield was originally built, you see those villas, there's also a pub, the turkey cock, but it was right in the line of the runway. And apparently, uh, people used to duck their heads while drinking a pint because the mosquitoes was almost hitting the, the pub on takeoff and landings. Mosquito was really what made the intruders more successful, right? And, That's and right. And aircraft that with the Bostons were, just weren't so good. No, no. I mean, the, the mosquito was, well, was born for it, wasn't it? Let's face it. It's, um, you know, you had reliability, you had the punch, the firepower, and the legs to actually fly from here at low level all the way across the continent to a designated German night fighter base and then orbit from a few miles out, wait for a, a, a German night fighter, and then sneaking up behind him is a mosquito. So that's why they seven. call them the bandits of the air. That's right, yeah. It's a way of keeping a German night fighter force on the ground. In early 1941, Allied Bomber Command begins a campaign of massive night raids on enemy targets. By 1943, RAF bombers have dropped over 20,000 tons of high explosive on Germany's industrial heartland. Fearing the crippling effect of continued raids on their war industry, the Germans strike back. This time with a secret weapon of their own, the radar-equipped night fighter. The results are devastating. In just under 15 months, Bomber Command loses 5,881 bombers. The Allies' best hope of countering these attacks is to penetrate deep into enemy territory and destroy German fighters on their airfields, where they are most vulnerable. And in 1943, there's only one Allied aircraft capable of carrying out such a hazardous mission, the de Havilland Mosquito. It's something completely different for us to go in at night and attack an airfield at North Feet. And we just didn't know what was going to happen. And I think when it did happen, it, it, it was quite frightening, yeah, it was scary, no doubt about it. If we uh, were going on an intruder mission as we were taking off, I would often think, well, I hope I'm going to see this air go a little later on tonight. I used to duck right down to a couple of hundred feet across the coast, because then you go across their defended area fast and they wouldn't get around to their anti-aircraft guns fast enough. We were always low-level intruders, so I mean, with a good moonlit night, they could see you from the ground. And when we got to our target area, the first thing we looked for was to see whether the airdrome lights were on. If they were on, we knew that there were there was operations uh, taking place. They were pretty smart. Uh, they knew that uh, there were intruders around. They took off and they stayed right down at 50 feet until they were at least 20 miles out. Uh, and then they'd start their climb to get up into the bomber street. So we seldom had any success except when they were coming into land. You'd head for the downwind side of the airdrome in the hope that they'd turn some lights on when they're on their approach. And if they did, uh, you'd try to take a crack at shooting them down. The problem was that uh, they knew we were there and they flashed this searchlight on the approach once their aircraft got past it. So all they did was cover the whole airfield in a blanket of anti-aircraft fire. So you had to fly through it. And that, I tell you straight, was frightening. The only hope we had then in circling around, 
whip in and try to get behind them. Getting them as they were touching down on the runway. After that, if, they, if you had any ammunition left, you were allowed to go anywhere you like and beat up transport on the ground, trains, canals. And then when you, well, more or less looked at the petrol gauge and said, I gotta go home, you turned around and made back. This air base went from night fighters to intruders. Now, at the beginning of 44, they bring a new group here, and that's under Picard. That's right, 140 wing. And Picard was sort of a legend already, wasn't he? Picard was. He, he made his debut in a, in a, in a film, actually, uh, in 1941 by the Crown Film Unit. Uh, they actually made a film called Target for Tonight, yeah. and he portrayed the pilot of F for Freddy. All from F for Freddy here. Huh? I'm here anyway. Yes, sir. I'm here, Skipper. OK, sir. OK, sir. Well, that's a change, anyway. They arrived in January of 44, and, of course, in February of 44, the raid on uh, Amiens, or Operation Jericho, was actually flown from this airfield. And if anyone could do the job, it was him. In January 1944, Allied intelligence learns that over 100 French resistance members are being held in a jail at Amiens, France, awaiting execution. The French underground requests an urgent airstrike to break open the prison walls and liberate their comrades. The task of planning the mission, codenamed Operation Jericho, is given to the RAF's most experienced mosquito navigator, Ted Sismore. Well, we knew we had a problem because uh, we were told that the objective was to break the prison walls to get some of the French uh, prisoners out, who were, I think, key members of the French underground, and they, they needed them out. Uh, the problem was, what, how do you break down walls, and how do you break down the inner walls without killing everybody inside? Well, first of all, on all targets, at low level, you need, if you can find one, a very good lead-in. And, of course, that prison, we had a very good lead-in with the road. Perfect. And that meant that we should attack the outside wall parallel to that road. We could then have a choice on how we attack the inside wall, because we, we knew which parts of the prison were critical. So the outside wall would be attacked with people at low level just, just dropping bombs straight into it. The inner wall would be attacked by people pulling up and doing shallow dive. The trouble with that sort of operation, you can never do it twice. You get one chance. But it was an urgent operation and, and it had to go ahead. At 10 a.m. on February 18th, 1944, a day before the executions are scheduled to begin, 19 Mosquito fighter bombers take off from Hunston Airfield and set out across the English Channel, headed for Amiens. Operation Jericho was a gamble for the Allies, and the stakes could not be higher. At risk are the lives of 38 elite RAF airmen, along with hundreds of French prisoners. February 18th, 1944, 19 RAF Mosquito bombers cross the French coast and into the hostile skies over Nazi-occupied France. Their mission, codenamed Operation Jericho, is to free over 100 French resistance fighters scheduled for execution. The target? The heavily guarded prison at Amiens. Mosquitoes came from Doulans to Albert and then turned sharply southwest. And they followed this old Roman road right down here to the prison. Halfway down, the typhoon split off to engage German fighters. And at 12.01, the first mosquito wave hit the prison.
whilst the raid was in operation, we could see the fighter defense beginning to operate, which is rather worrying. The fighter airfield at Amiens was very close to the target, so it was almost inevitable that some fighters would get airborne from there and we would uh, have problems. The first wave were the New Zealanders, and their job was to break the northeastern wall of the prison. And they came in 1201, zero feet, dropped their bombs. The bombs skidded on the snow. They had an 11 second fuse for the mosquitoes to get out of there before the bombs went up. The second wave was so tight on coming in behind them, so the first bombs hadn't exploded yet. So they actually had to divert and go around the prison 360 degrees before they came in. And their objective was to hit the buildings themselves. Once we started getting the actual reports, of course, we were hearing very good news that the walls had been broken and uh, even one or two reports that they'd seen people running out. And the underground was around the prison waiting for them. Uh, in, in quite, we gathered in quite some numbers so that they were, what shall I say, hustled away quickly before the Germans could organize a, a recapture. Of course, the loss of Picard was very sad and rather disturbing, really, as he was a character, a rather special character. After the raid, Picard waited around for a while and he could see through the smoke that the prisoners were getting out. In fact, more than 250 of them did escape, and the raid was a great success. But that delay allowed the German fighters to close in on him. And he crashed just northeast of Amiens. The French locals took his body out of the wreckage, but before they could bury them, the Germans took them and they buried them here in the old World War I cemetery at St. Pierre. Charles Picard, DSO in two bars, DFC, pilot, Royal Air Force. 18th February, 1944, age 28. At the rising and going down of the sun, we will always remember him. Picard was a legend in the RAF, and his action here at Amiens only added to it. Picard lost his life in the most amazing air raid of the entire Second World War. Following the success of Amiens, mosquito crews are called upon time and again to perform similar surgical strikes. Late in the war, Denmark's resistance movement sends a telegram pleading for an attack on Shell House, a former Shell oil building now occupied by the Gestapo. The target, a collection of damning evidentiary files and resistance activities. But the Gestapo anticipates an attack and places 26 Danish prisoners as a human shield in the upper floors of the building. We were called up again to Baker Street and uh, asked if we could attack this one. Well, of course, the first reaction was, how on earth are we going to find a building in the middle of a city? And if we do this job, we're going to kill all those people. And he, they said, well, you may have to do that. It was difficult, but it was possible, and, and it was successful, except, of course, that one aircraft hit a pylon on the railway line uh, and crashed into the school just short of the target. This confused the people behind because of the smoke. And some of the 
later people drop bombs on onto the school, which was sad. But you have to look on both sides. One or two of the people in the attic were killed. One or two were badly injured because they had to jump from about the fourth floor. But some got out alive. Well, if we hadn't had the accident and the disaster of killing some school children, then they wouldn't have had the, those Danes probably would never have got out. So it's all, it was a very mixed feeling about the raid, really. But it was successful in the sense that it was the documentation that was wanted, and of course it caught fire and, uh, and the building burnt. The raids on Amiens and Shell House are just two of hundreds of daring low-level mosquito attacks, which would leave the enemy reeling. The Luftwaffe is simply unable to counter the range, speed and firepower of what has become the deadliest weapon in the Allied airborne arsenal. But in June 1944, Germany would unleash its own super weapon, the B-1 flying bomb. Beginning a new reign of terror over England's civilian population. the village of Moorbeck in French Flanders, and it's approximately 120 miles as the crow flies from here to London. And this is really a great remnant of the Second World War. This is a V-1 launching site. But of course, in 1943, the Allies didn't know that. They got reports from the French resistance about the Germans building bunkers in these odd positions down the Pas de Calais and in the Nord region, and you can actually see one of the smaller bunkers over here. But it wasn't the smaller bunkers that concerned them. It's this one right here, this long, skinny one curved at the end, which they dubbed a ski site. They thought that this would be related to the German rocket program in Pino Monde. Pino Monde, in northeastern Germany, is home to a massive factory complex, where the Nazis are engaged in the development and construction of a new terror weapon, the V-1 flying bomb. Ski bunkers were actually the storage buildings for the V-1 rockets. And the V-1 rockets were a nifty piece of engineering. It was a torpedo about 25 feet long with a stovepipe on top, which was the pulse jet engine. They would store them in here for quick delivery to launching pad. So you can actually see the trolley marks where they'd carry the V-1s in. It was like a cradle. But this was not the final preparation for the launching. The setting of the altimeter or the compass or even the warhead detonators would be done at other bunkers closer to the launching pad, just over here at the far end of the forest. This is the Richt House, or the non-magnetic building, and you can see there's not much left of it. It must have had a bad encounter with an Allied bomb. But what happened here is the final stage of preparation before launching, they would bring the V-1 in. You can see what's left of the doorway here. This was a non-magnetic building, and it had to be that because this is where they set the compass. And they would put two detonators in, one on the belly and one on the nose. So if it landed flat, it would go off, or if it came down nose first, it would also go off. Once this was done, the wings are attached, it's still on its trolley, and it's taken over to the launching pad. This is the launching ramp, and it's really all that's left of the entire launching facility. It's built of cinder blocks, and the idea was it would protect the crew from any explosion that might go on during the rocket launching. And within it, they put a catapult, 150 feet long. And of course, the reason they needed a catapult is that the V-1 was only airworthy at 150 miles an hour. So the catapult had to fire it out of here like a slingshot. When everything is going, they'd run back to a little control bunker over there, and from there, they pressed a button which would ignite the jet engine. 
So when everything was set, the engine is firing, the Germans would press the button, and the rocket would go. One thing that was totally unique about the V1 was the sound it made. It was really infamous. Because it was a pulse engine, it would start off with fuel coming in, it would be ignited by the oxygen, and then it would explode, combust. And once it combusted, a new amount of fuel would go in, and then it would combust. So you had a effect. In these positions, the Germans planned to rain terror on London. It was going to be a new blitz with new vengeance weapons. The Allied reaction to the German rocket program was swift and they initiated Operation Crossbow to destroy all German rocket installations. The heavy bombers went across to Germany and destroyed Pinamunde, and they launched attacks on every one of the ski sites, and there were more than 100 of them. At first, it was heavy bombers bombing from about 10,000 feet. And you can see evidence of their bombing all the way through this park. This is a crater maybe made by a 500-pounder bomb from a Lancaster. Some of the fighter bombers they used here were the Mosquitoes. They also had no-ball raids, or what the pilots started to call no-balls raids, because when they came in low level to attack these sites, they were hit by rifle fire, machine gun fire, and light anti-aircraft fire. V-1 sites, you couldn't attack at low level. They were sited uh, in awkward places anyway, and of course the building was just a single story. So the only sensible way of the Mosquito was to do shallow dive bombing. You'd go in low level to avoid uh, interception. And then just before the target, pull up to about two and a half thousand feet. Come in in the shallow dive, uh, bomb in the dive. And go back down to the deck to, to escape. By May 1944, all 100 of the ski sites were destroyed. But the Germans reacted very quickly, and they built modified V-1 sites, and they got rid of the ski buildings. And these were very difficult to detect because they were built around farms and in little woodlands. There was no clear bunkers to attack. And on June 13, 1944, the first V-1s fell in London, and a new blitz had begun. V-1 attacks on England are devastating. The civilian population is thrown into alarm. And with little defense against the high-speed bombs, the Allies look once again to the Mosquito, hoping their tried and tested super weapon can turn back this new threat. June 6th, 1944, the Allied invasion of Normandy after five long years of occupation, the liberation of Western Europe is underway. But the Nazi threat is far from over. In truth, the Germans, with their advanced rocket technology, are about to unleash a wave of terror attacks on England's civilian population with their new secret weapon, the V-1 flying bomb. On June 13, 1944, only one week after D-Day, the first V-1s rained down on London. There were so many V-1s coming across through the circuit of the airfield that, that it was untenable. underneath a couple when I was near London and of course when you saw it and the, that motor cut everybody hit the ditch you know because you know it it was going to crash we heard this one come over 
and the engine stopped. So everybody fell on the floor. The dust came out from the walls and the ceiling about six inches. And I got up from the floor to my drink, which was on the bar. And as soon as I touched the glass, it disintegrated, just fell apart. And I always remember the barman, who also appeared from the other side of the bar. He said, I saw that, so I'd better have one on the house. <laughs> Ground crews fight desperately to repel the V-1 attacks. Anti-aircraft fire and barrage balloons prove marginally effective. Nonetheless, the majority of flying bombs slip through. The Allies quickly realize the most effective way to stop the V-1 is to intercept them in the air. Once again, they turn to the unparalleled speed and firepower of the de Havilland Mosquito. When the V-1 started to come around, we were taken right off of intruding in the hopes of shooting down these V-1s. There was a vivid flash on the French coast. All you'd see is a big flame, because it trailed a flame about 20 feet long. We could see it coming out across the channel, so we would uh, do an interception. These things were going uh, pretty close to 400 miles an hour and sometimes a little more. And uh, even diving on them, we had trouble catching them. immediately decided on a tactic of patrolling at 10,000 feet. We peel over and try to get the mosquito up to 440 miles an hour. We were gaining some because the fire coming out of the ass end of the V1 was getting bigger. The mosquito was screaming in every joint. I thought the wings would never stand it. We began to level out, and the clock said 400 miles per hour. We're too close. I shut my eyes as the cannons began banging away. The real danger was if you picked up a piece of debris in the radiator. But the other problem was that it produced a very vivid white flash that would blind you. When the explosion came, I thought I was going to be dead. The goddamn thing went off right in our faces. I bet we're all blistered, my pilot said. He was talking about the mosquito. There wasn't an inch of paint anywhere. The mosquito was black. No numbers, no letters, nothing. Once we got uh, the hang of the tactic, uh, we were fairly successful. And I think 418 Squadron shot down about 80 of these B-1s. <laughs> Russ Bannock goes on to destroy a total of 19 V-1 rockets and 11 German night fighters, earning him the distinction as Canada's second highest scoring fighter ace of the Second World War. The Mosquito proves a highly effective weapon against the last of the V-1 attacks, but the war in the air is changing. 1944 also sees the introduction of Germany's powerful V-2 rocket the Messerschmitt 262 jet fighter, heralding a new era of air warfare. By the time war against Germany ends in May 1945, the Mosquito's reign is all but over. This is the church in the small village of Pointe de Picardy in northwest France. It's about 100 miles from England, and during the Second World War, there are many air bases in this area and many transport centers that were targets of the Allied air attacks. There's a cemetery just up here that contains 149 Commonwealth airmen. Most of the men buried here were killed on bombing operations. Here's the grave of Flying Officer Harry Jones of Montreal. He was a pilot of a Halifax bomber when he was shot down on June 8, 1944. But there's another crew in here that's quite different. They were the men known as intruders. This is the grave of R.J. Tomlinson of Sherbrooke, Quebec. He was the pilot of a Mosquito, and here's his navigator, 
Charles Essam, who were shot down on intruder operations on June 3, 1944. The intruders were so effective that the Germans referred to them as the bandits of the air. Though it has never enjoyed the historic fanfare of the Spitfire or the Lancaster bomber, the fact remains that for four crucial years, the Mosquito, with its matchless combination of speed, maneuverability, and firepower, was the Allies' most versatile aircraft. Piloted by fearless crews, its hundreds of high-risk missions hastened the end of the Second World War, undoubtedly saving countless lives that might yet have been lost.